he he started uh, uh, humbly with uh, the Rhode Island Federal District Court, and uh, and he's helped so many courts uh, in the circuit and across the uh, country. He's a professor of biology at UMass Dartmouth, as I think you, many of you know, and his real specialty in um, uh, virology in particular. So. Um, Without any further ado, we put this thing together because um, um, so many things have been changing. There was so much interest the first time around, and we thought it would be really good to give staff and the bar a chance just to hear from Dr. Bromage uh, firsthand instead of through us and, um, and to pose any questions that you might have about uh, where things uh, are going and uh, how... Uh, what we should be doing and what the future might hold. So I'm gonna turn it over to, uh, to Dr. Marwaj to make some introductory comments. And then we're gonna take, we're gonna take questions. Uh, Nora and Frank are, gonna, are going to uh, moderate in the sense of fielding the questions. So either put your hand up uh, using the, the, um, the uh, hand thing on the, on the Zoom <laughs> or, uh, or just try to ask a, uh, ask a question or send a chat um, uh, question and, and Nora and Frank will, uh, will moderate all of that and I'll try to keep the, uh, keep the thing moving. So Aaron, thanks so much for, for joining us. Um, you've been just invaluable and so I turn it over to you. Thank you very much, Judge Smith, for that introduction. So hi, everybody. Um, I'm just going to give a I mean, a brief state of where we are and where I think we're going from or where we are with the, the pandemic right now, and then really just open it up for questions on, you know, from the floor. So, you know, we are at a stage of, you know, this particular surge where, like, thankfully, we are reaching the peak locally and in New England. Um, we are in a pretty rough state just in general that we're seeing, you know, infections that we've never seen before in Rhode Island and Massachusetts. Um, and even though, and it is, Omicron is less severe, but when you take something that is, you know, three times less severe, but you have 10 times the number of people infected at the one time, we still end up with the massive disruptions that we're seeing right now between schools, businesses, um, and most importantly, hospitals right now. Um, I think the biggest societal threat we sort of face at the moment is no, not so much our ICU capacity and beds, they're handling it very well. It's actually our emergency rooms right now. Um, we're finding that emergency rooms right throughout New England and really all coastal states in general are really struggling with the, the demand of both normal accidents and injuries that we have from society being open and add on top of that 25 to 35% increase in um, ER visits because of COVID on top of that. Um, and, you know, locally, you know, I've got my students working at Brown in the ER as both doctors and nurses. Um, I've got them, you know, working right throughout New England and they're saying the same thing over and over again, which is there is no ability in our hospitals, in our ER rooms right now to separate COVID admissions from a broken leg. And, you know, to be very plain, they said, if you go in for a broken leg, you will leave with a cast and COVID. Um, there's just no way to separate those two out. So unfortunately, that's where we are at the moment with infections locally. It's really our hospitals. Um, now, in regards to infection numbers and where we're going, um, there's still a little bit of an up to go with this. Um, but we definitely are seeing it plateauing. Um, the mass biobot data, which is monitoring the wastewater coming out of the northern and southern uh, regions of Boston, uh, has reached their peak um, and has started to plateau and turn. There's now about five states around the US that started with the Omicron surge early that have peaked and started to bend and come back down. Uh, we're even seeing Puerto Rico that's had some really high numbers starting to turn. So what we're expecting here is that, you know, over the next week or so, 10 days, we should see a plateau in the numbers that we've got. Um, and then there should be a very steep decline. As quick as it went up, it should drop down. Um, and it's going to drop down maybe to about 70% of what it is now. 
And then we're going to have this bit of a shoulder that's going to drag out maybe into the month of February um, as people that have really locked themselves up and locked away start engaging a little bit more in society, they're going to contribute to that long tail with this. Um, but the, the biggest impact I think you will find will be the next two to three weeks, hospitals for the next two to three weeks, you will see data in regards to ICU admission and death, unfortunately, start to pick up. Um, they're always a laggy indicator, but they will be behind where the infections are just because it takes longer to get reported. The upside is, and I know some people won't see this as an upside, is that the current estimates are somewhere around 50 to 60% of everybody will be infected with Omicron by the time we get onto the other side of this at the end of February. Um, that puts us in a much better situation that we have been, you know, with past, you know, in the past history with this. We will have an enormous breadth of immunity then in the in society in general, from people that were infected and then reinfected, from people that were infected and then vaccinated, or people that were vaccinated with a breakthrough. You get the the highly specific nature of the vaccine and the diversity that comes from infection in regards to your immune system. Or you've got Delta immunity and Omicron immunity, or Alpha immunity and Omicron immunity. And by the time we get that level of societal protection in regards to, to immunity, I think we're going to find that the way that society perceives, and we're already seeing this with the government, the way the government is acting to the pandemic will change significantly. Um, I mean, I've just been working with the Spanish government this morning where they've, they've just notified everybody that um, come the end of this wave, which they're predicting in about four to five weeks, um, they're going to stop testing, they're stopping contact tracing, they're stopping anything to do with COVID restrictions unless you are symptomatic and require hospitalization. They've got to the point where they're saying it's over. We are not going to be there, but we should expect things should change quite significantly towards March um, and certainly into April. And that sort of, you know, unless we see another variant that we're not seeing right now, um, if unless we see something else pop up, um, we really should be in for a, a bit of calm through March, April, May and June. Um, I can't predict much further out for that because we just don't know how it's going to behave in six months. Um, but I think that, you know, from court side of things, but just general life side of things, I am very much looking forward to March, April, May in order to be at a much better spot, much like we were, you know, the previous beginning of summer where we could feel quite normal for what was going on. Um, Long-term side of things, I think we should expect that, you know, we saw the, the fourth booster be recommended for um, immunocompromised people and people at high risk. They may normalize that for people over 65. Um, I don't think it will be really well, I don't think we'll see a lot of take up of that, especially if the fourth booster comes four or five months after the third, um, because I think at that stage, we're not looking as crazy in regards to numbers. Um, but I would not be surprised that in October of next year, there will be a variant vaccine that we do take, um, just alongside with the influenza vaccine that we take. So, I mean, I'm going to stop it there, just to say we, we are in a tough spot. There is a lot of infection out there. Um, if you have immunity, uh, we know that severity is about 80 times, like, sorry, 80% lower than Delta. If you don't have immunity, it's only about 15% less severe than Delta. Um, so it's really about where your immune status is, infection, vaccination, to what this does on an individual level. But the biggest problem we have right now is just the sheer number of people testing positive, sickness and disruption in communities, which is going to persist for about three weeks. All right, that's great. Uh, so. Uh... People should feel free to put their questions in the uh, in the chat or use use the uh, uh, the hand. Let me just uh, maybe start it off, uh, Dr. Bromage, if you could talk a little bit about the um, the isolation periods. Uh, that's been getting a lot of attention. Yeah, uh, five days, ten days, seven days. Um, maybe you could talk about that for a minute. 
Yeah, so um, we've known for about a year that 10 days was super safe. Um, so unless you're immunocompromised or still you know, very, very sick, that by the end of 10 days, um, being able to isolate intact virus that can infect another person or cells was incredibly unlikely. Um, about six months or so ago, the United Kingdom changed their approach to isolation. They changed it to seven days with two lateral flow tests, rapid antigen tests at the end of that time to clear you to come out on day eight. And they were finding a smattering of people around about day seven and day eight was still able to test positive on a lateral flow, which means that they could infect other people and needed to stay in. But a lot of people could come out on day eight and rejoin society without um, affecting other people. Um, I don't know how or why it happened. And that's a big part of the reason I've been a very strong critic of it. Um, CDC then changed their regulations to five days without a test. And it would have been great if that came with data, but it just came as a directive rather than this is why we're doing it. And so, you know, we found, I found myself at contradiction to the CDC with this because it didn't make sense to what I have seen with all the testing that I'm doing. Um, just as reference, I've run about 7 million tests on people in businesses and organizations um, you know, over the past 18 months, um, you know, bringing people back to work when they can't infect people. So I, I really have the data there to say that this is the right way to go forward. And so what we knew from our work was roughly 25 to 30% of everybody on day six will still be able to infect people. And so it just didn't jive with me at all to say, yep, day six, you're good to come out. And then after the pushback, Dr. Walensky came out and said, yes, we agree. Um, that is the case. We, we expect roughly 20% of all the people on day six to still be infectious, but we want them to wear a mask and the mask is going to be the thing that stops them from transmitting to another person. And I think from a perspective of society, that sort of makes sense, but a perspective of your own personal health and health with your family and that side of things, what I didn't want is people to feel that it was okay to get to day six and go and visit a vulnerable person. That just doesn't make sense. So myself and a few others, you know, started pushing back and they revised the CDC, you know, regulations. They didn't go as far to say you must have a rapid antigen test um, but they said, we strongly suggest you do if you can get access to one. Um, just today, um, quite a strong study did come out with Omicron um, that said that at day seven, we still have quite a few infections. So all the indications and data says that returning to normal activities on day six is a really like a one in three chance that you are going to go out and infect somebody else. Um, and that's not where we want to be. So if you have access to testing, um, I strongly suggest that on day six, you take one of those tests. And if it is blaring in regards to its color, stay in quarantine or in isolation for another two days. Um, if it's nice and faint, you know that the next day you're fine to go out. And if it's negative, you can feel comfortable about what you're doing. So a little bit disappointed with that, that it doesn't seem to be a public health decision, it seems to be a decision made to keep businesses up and going and make sure that you have enough employees. I will flip that round a little bit and say then the most, the highest chance of transmission happens inside your house. Um, and it's one of the things that I've said to all the courts is when you have a family member who is infected, even if you are vaccinated, you should not be at work. Um, the amount of breakthrough cases given, even with vaccination that happens from an infected child, an infected partner that goes to our person that's vaccinated is very, very high. Um, and the reason I want you to think about that is why I'm vaccinated, aren't I immune? Immun immunity isn't binary. And the simplest way to think about it is um, think of a firefighter. If a firefighter runs into a burning building with just normal street clothes on, They've got about 
30 seconds before they're at harm, they get burnt. If they put on wool clothing and some protective gear, maybe they get a few minutes before they get hurt. And that's somebody with either prior immunity or two shots of the vaccine. You get a little bit longer in the danger, but after a certain amount of time and exposure, you're going to get hurt. Then put a firefighter in a turnout suit, so their full suit. They run into a burning building. They can't stay in there for an hour. They can't stay in there for half an hour. They get 15 minutes, 20 minutes in that burning inferno before the heat, the fire overwhelms the protection they've got and they get hurt. That's the same with vaccination. Vaccination is not just a firewall, like a wall that goes up and says yes or no. When you reach a certain level of exposure, your, your immunity will be overcome and you will get infected. So one of the most important things in regards to quarantine and isolation is if you've got an infected family member, the risk of in-house transmission is as high as 70% of household occupants will get infected. And that's really where you should come up with a more compassionate, but you know, a policy where those people can just stay home until you run through that quarantine period for that person. Um, so there, I've provided guidelines to the court about things that they can do. Um, if anyone wants access, just reach out either through Judge Smith or myself or, you know, through the team and we can get it to you. But please be mindful of household contacts. It's really not a smart thing to do to say, my child is sick, but I'm coming to work because you're almost certainly bringing the virus into work that way. So we have a, a couple of, you mentioned testing, rapid testing. And so this is probably a good, um, uh, good time to bring up uh, one of the questions, which has to do with um, uh, where do you stand on the rapid testing in light of Omicron and, and the way that those tests are used, just nasal or putting them in the throat and how to do that. Uh, maybe you could comment on that. Yeah, so all of our rapid antigen tests are only approved for swabbing the anterior part of your nose. Um, and the reason they're approved that way is it's not hard to do and we can put it into a non-licensed medical profession. Like you can do it yourself. You don't need to have a doctor or nurse doing it. Um, that worked really well for all the prior variants. Like we were picking it up very early in the nose um, and it was giving us a, an adequate signal of being infected or infectious. Omicron is a little different. And part of the fact that it is not as severe is it's not infecting the lung tissue anywhere near as much as what say Delta is. It has a harder time infecting lung cells, but it has a really easy time infecting your throat. Um, and so you need to sample where the virus is. And obviously you couldn't sample your lungs, but if you think of Delta highly infected in your lungs, you do most of your breathing through your nose, which brings the virus up and it traps it inside your nose, which means it's really quite easy to get a good sample. With Omicron mainly being in your throat, um, it's not coming up through your nose as easily. And so there's a lot of anecdotal evidence that comes from both all the work that we've done in the United Kingdom where we do a combined throat and nose swab. Um, but now the work that is coming out from Japan and England and even the US now, showing that you actually pick up an infection about a day earlier um, if you do a combined throat and nose swab. Um, it is absolutely something I do not recommend you do on a child. Um, they'll gag and you could end up hurting them. Leave that to medical professionals. But if you're testing yourself with a rapid antigen test, there's a really good NHS video on this that you just jump on YouTube and you'll find it throat and nose swab. You just get in front of a mirror, you swab on either side of your epiglottis, you know, near the arches at the back of your throat for about 10 or 15 seconds, you do a single nostril and you put it in. And then the reliability of that result is really quite good to determine whether you have um, an in, enough virus there to, to be able to infect other people. Um, and that's just a, a thing I do wanna point out. A PCR will tell you if you've got fragments of the virus in you, not infectiousness. An antigen test is a really good test to tell you whether right when you take this test, can you infect another person? If it's negative and you've taken a good swab, you know that for the four, six hours after that, what you do is not going to be at risk for transmission. 
Um, but once you get eight, 12, 24 hours out, it's not a really good predictor for that. So a rapid antigen test gives you a work day of safety, but it's not something you'll do in the morning and think I can go and visit a high risk person at eight o'clock in the night and get away with it. It's negative for the night type approach that you like to think about. All right, I see uh, one hand up at least, uh, Brian uh, Lamoureux. Brian? Uh, thank you, John. Uh, Doc, you talked about um, the sort of the viral exposure and, and, and load. And we learned early on that uh, one of the things we should focus on is distance and also time in an environment. Taking otherwise healthy people, whether vaccinated or not, so putting immunocompromised out of the mix, is there a correlation between the amount of viral load you're exposed to by either someone sneezing in your face, you spent six hours with someone, and then the disease um, after that in terms of its severity? Is there any correlation? Yeah, so for most pathogens, yes. Um, if I increase the dose that I'm exposing an animal, because we don't get to do this with humans, an animal too, the severity of disease will change significantly. Um, we have not observed that in humans or animal studies with this particular one. It's sort of, um, it's really just the chance of you getting infected versus not versus severity of disease. It just, um, it only takes one viral particle to infect you. Um, it just, it takes a lot longer to get that one to establish when you are, when you have immunity. So we haven't really seen that in a household where you have the highest level of transmission, you know, New England houses are buttoned up tight right now. We're trying not to pay an arm and a leg in, you know, heating costs, which means every breath that I put out, someone else is breathing back in in my house, it means the dose, the load that they get would be enormous. We're not really seeing more severity in a house because of that. So it's really more of do you tip over into being infected versus am I going to end up in ICU because of a large dose? So kind of a couple of related questions, Aaron. One about um, uh, relating back to the uh, isolation period. If, if you have a family member who has COVID, they're isolating for that suggested period of time. Let's say it's between seven and 10 days, I think, according to your guidance. What about the uh, the family member who's vaccinated and boosted, who's living in the same house in yep. terms of testing and isolation. Yeah. So, you know, being unreasonable, you get out of the house or you go and live in a basement apartment to start your clock to zero. And if you start your clock and don't have any further contact, we only need about five days to, re to reveal over 95% of infections. But let's be real. If you've got somebody in your house that is infected, you are either going to look after them or stay in the house. I mean, we tried to do it with my son a year ago. I think we lasted about 24 hours on trying to do some sort of household quarantine and it just doesn't work. So the risk that happens then is um, the person who is infected builds up their viral load, the viral load drops down and that tick over of you becoming infected could happen on day one it could be day two, but it could also be day five. Um, and so just getting them through to being negative is not enough to clear you for work because you could be in that process of brewing an infection and becoming infectious yourself. So what we have done is when, especially when you're looking after an infected child or partner where the contact is ongoing, um, consistent, um, the best policy for that is roughly 10 days. Um, you allow the five full days of a brew and come down with the infected person. And then we give you a five full days to brew after that. And then we get a test at the end of that to bring you back. Um, I literally just had this today where I've had, um, there was a child that was infected through school. We put the mother and actually the rest of the family into a household quarantine. Um, we're now on day seven and the mother has just tested positive. Um, and so that's the, like, we just, we kept the mum out of work because we knew that this was going to happen. Um, similar type scenario actually happened with a partner, past partner tested positive. Um, day eight, my person at work was going to test positive, 
but we had them in that 10 day quarantine. So we captured that. Um, it's what I've been working with very hard with my own university is to come up with a flexible enough work schedule. Again, because the risk of transmission is so high at home that you really need to give them 10 full days before they're not bringing much risk back into your workplace. Um, and you would say with a minutes. test, if Same. you could get one, and you would say with a, with a rapid test, if you, yep. if you get one. Yep. Um, and especially it becomes even more critical if your job is in the physical proximity or shares a physical space, um, you know, with another person. Like if you're working in a single office by yourself, the risk is not as high because who are you going to transmit to? Um, but if you are working in an area that brings you in close contact with lots of people, all you're really doing is setting yourself up for anxiety with the rest of the people. If you do test positive, now you've got more people that actually come out. So I would rather give up five days from one person than to lose five, 10 days out of a whole bunch of people um, because you brought them back too early. Now, uh, there's a question that asked, is it, is it important to know which variant you might have, Delta? or Omicron, and, and if you are infected, then uh, should you get a, before you get a booster, should you get a booster after an infection? And if so, how long uh, after? Uh, yeah, so I'll start with the booster part. Um, a booster gives you excellent protection against both hospitalization and infection for about 10 weeks. Um, at, you know, like through that 10 week period, the protective ability to not get infected um, is around about 98%. So you're about 50 fold higher than an unvaccinated person at that stage. So if you haven't been boosted and you're eligible, the simplest way to not get infected right now is a booster. Um, that protection kicks in after about five days. So all you need is five days. So that will get you through this peak and the other side coming down. So once we get out to about that 10 week mark, um, what we're seeing in Israel, which is one of the leaders in that third shot, is we're seeing just this general decay um, of immunity against infection, but not a decay in immunity against hospitalization and those things. Um, and the decay is dropping down and we just don't know what rate it's dropping at the moment. But that's really only important when the world is burning like it is now, because if we get to a good spot of community infection where it's really low, it's not going to have the same problem it is now where everywhere you turn, you know, one in every eight people in Rhode Island is currently infected. Um, yeah, that's a pretty steep odds that you're going to come across somebody. So Omicron boost is important. Um, what were the other parts to that, please, Judge Smith? So is it important to know which one? No, very yeah. yeah. So from a, you know, if I'm getting it and just getting a little bit sick side of things, no, there's no, there's nothing that changes in your treatment because there's not really treatment for it. You know, if you end up with a mild case, which just means you don't get hospitalized, um, there is nothing that changes in regards to how you look after that infection. Where Omicron Delta does become important is if you are a high risk for poor outcomes. Um, if are infected with Delta, um, rem, like the Remsevir, so the Regeneron antibody, um, will work very well where it doesn't work for Omicron. So if you needed monoclonal antibody treatment, it is important to know which one you've got. Unfortunately, we're not really set up well locally to be able to discriminate between the different variants. Um, it takes a, it's not a specialized test, you've just got to find the lab that has the right test. So you, it's called a TAC path assay that actually has different genes that we can look at. Um, but by the time you get the results to that, you may be at the point where doing the monoclonal treatment you know, doesn't work. So really knowing which variant you've got is only important if you are getting to, going towards severe disease or you are likely to go to severe disease based on some other health issue. Um, when the treatment becomes more available, say the Pfizer drug, it doesn't care which variant it is. It works equally for both of them. Um, Delta definitely gives more pronounced symptoms, um, especially losing the smell and taste. We don't see that as much with Omicron. Um, Omicron presents a little earlier with symptoms, um, very much more cold-like at the beginning part of it. Um, but, but changing trajectory is not much at all. doesn't uh, affect much at all. So you brought up monoclonal 
antibodies, and there's a question about that, uh, about what your view of them is, and um, maybe you can speak to that. Yeah, so basically, you know, monoclonal antibodies for treatment for this is the equivalent of you getting bitten by a rabid animal and going in for the treatment that you do for that. Um, what they literally do is take antibodies against the rabies virus and inject it here, here, and into your thigh and thigh and give you a huge amount of antibody that is being generated in another person. They put that inside you. And what they're hoping is as the virus rears its head up inside your body, that antibody from other people will bind to it and neutralize it and stop the, the viral progression moving forward while your own body starts to create its own immunity to it. Um, so with this side of things, the, the monoclonal antibodies here were made in a lab. Um, so they, some of the first people that got infected, they found the, literally the B cell that actually bound to a part of the virus that would neutralize it and stop attaching to your cells. They sequenced it and put it into a system that allowed us to make a lot of it in the lab. Um, and then they started expressing it. And basically what it is, is just providing your body with passive immunity um, that protects you for about 60 to 90 days. Um, and so what it is, is just giving you circulating antibody, which as the virus tries to replicate and come out of the cell, the antibody binds to it and neutralizes it and allows your body to clear it out while your own body is starting to make antibodies to do the same thing. So it has been very much a miracle treatment for Delta. Um, it was remarkable about how quickly it would turn people around. Um, a lot of people, especially in the Southern part of the country were using it and it did have great outcomes for them. Um, unfortunately, as I said, with Omicron, the specific site these antibodies bind to has mutated and changed. So the antibody doesn't bind to it anymore. So that particular monoclone is now only useful for Delta, not for Omicron. There is the other one, and I cannot pronounce it. It starts with an, o, uh, with an S, a Sotramavib or something like that. Um, that one does work, and that one works well. Same process, neutralizes the virus, doesn't allow it to get into other cells, and again, provides you with good protection. The bad part about it is it is incredibly rare and difficult to get hold of because they just can't manufacture it at scale um, that is needed. Um, that is the unfortunate part about the timing of this surge where we've got treatments coming out that will protect people from poor outcomes, but they're not readily accessible. And given the monstrous number of you know, people that we have infected, there is clearly going to be a rationing of care when it comes to those treatments. Now there's a question that asks if there's, uh, if you have any uh, idea why some people with the same exposure, both of whom have been vaccinated, uh, might have a completely different reaction uh, to the same level of infection, let's say in a, in a household. And, and is there any, uh, any relation to blood types or anything else? Yeah, no, the blood type thing came up early and, you know, there was something there, but it's really hard to work out that there's anything of importance and what can you do anyway? Um, so as we've all seen from, you know, yourself getting vaccinated or people getting infected, there is a really wide range in immune responses. Um, you know, my first vaccine shot was sore arm. My second one, I was down for three days and I never wanted to see a vaccine again. Um, I finally did go and get the boost and then the boost was nothing. Um, I was fine with that. And I've had people that have had nothing with the vaccines and I've had people that have had, you know, really rough days with the vaccine. And that's the same with infection. You've got people that, don't even be de develop symptoms and others that obviously end up in much worse situation. So there is a huge indiv individual, uh, individuality associated with immune responses just in general, a uh, great variability there. Um, we do know that you know, very clearly the amount of antibody that you have circulating at any one given time dictates whether you're going to get infected or not immediately after a booster or immediately after that second shot, if you just got it, you know, within that five to seven days, you've got enormous levels of antibody and that can withstand almost any infection that comes at you during that time. But as it starts to decline, you become more susceptible. 
And that's why, you know, two people exposed to the same exposure will be at a different state, um, even if they were vaccinated at the same time because of individual rate of decline, um, you know, of immunity. And then there's other things, you know, good diet, lack of sleep. Um, you cannot discount any of those things in the ability to protect yourself that if you're not getting adequate sleep, you suppress your immune system. If you're not eating balanced diet and getting you know, nutrients and things like that, you're suppressing your immune system. Um, you know, stress, I mean, working crazy hours and lots of stress suppresses your immune system. So two people challenged at the same time will have very different physiological responses based on own individual differences. So a couple more questions about living at home with uh, infection or someone who is infected, um, recognizing that you're not a doctor, but for, for, for someone who is infected and at, at home or if their family members are at home, now what's your best advice on how to, what they should be doing, how they should handle it? Yeah, so um, it depends on what your goal, goal is. And so if your goal is to write out your infection, not infect my household members. The plans are you need to sequester yourself away as much as possible from everyone else in the house and avoid sharing air. So that means, you know, in a bedroom, that means cracking a window open in that bedroom so you've got good air exchange. When you do need to come out to come into shared areas, you should be wearing masks. Um, just because again, everything is just so tight in a house. Um, HEPA filters can work, but probably not practical, you know, on a home scale unless you've already invested in them. So we have had quite successfully, you know, a person in one bedroom that has limited access to the house when the other people are there, um, the rest of the house, and then other people having the rest of the house, but not being in the kitchen or in a living room when the infected person is in that space. And roughly five days to six days is a good period of time, you know, to do that. A basement apartment is even is even better. Um, so anything that filters the amount that comes out, um, exchanges the air with just a window cracked open a little bit, um, those type of things will help in home transmission and try to drop it down. Um, you know, if you're trying to obviously stop it going to other people, like other neighbors and things like that, stay home, keep your bubble tight. Even if your kids are not infected now, they probably will be. So try to be you know, mindful of that. Um, the sort of the medical health advice with this is don't lock yourself away in a bedroom at all times. Make sure that if you are feeling well enough that you're going outside and getting that vitamin D from the sun, exercising when you can, just don't exercise in the same space that other people are going to be. Like jump on a treadmill, open the window, um, you know, run and do those type of things you shouldn't be shutting down your body and your life to run through the infection when you're physically capable to do those things. Um, and basically, you know, what I would do, you know, I would go and jump on the treadmill, I would run, I'd lock the door, I'd open the window, let that air out before anyone else would come into that space, just so that they're not walking into, you know, craziness of my breath. Um, but masks do have a really big impact on in-house transmission especially a high quality mask on the person who's infected um, and then work out who you're protecting um, side of things, eat well, sleep well, get your exercise and sun. If you're not eating well, but you know, multivitamin side of things um, and just, you know, work your way through it that way. Now you mentioned masks and there's a question about, uh, about the difference between uh, N95s, KN95s, 94s and so forth. Uh, surgical masks, cloth masks. Uh, could you uh, run through those for us? Yeah, so um, high quality masks don't filter according to size. And that's a, you know, a bit that anyone that's sort of going against, like say masks don't work, don't understand that masks actually work on you know, principles of physics. Um, they actually have different charged layers of material. Like if you ever cut, you know, say a high quality mask up, you'll find there's three or four layers of material. There's some that actually repel water. There's some that if you got styrofoam beads, they would stick to. They actually attract particles and stick them to the material is a big part of their ability to filter things out. It's not their actual principles, uh, the, the filtering side of things that most people expect. If you were to wash a mask, all of that 
physics and chemistry that's associated with these disappear. And that's why things like even a high quality cloth mask, after you wash it once or twice, its ability to filter trap particles out of the air that you want to trap um, are not as good. But yeah, you know, one ply is reasonable, two ply better, three ply, you know, cloth mask better again. And then you start working your way up into surgical and the other ones. So the highest rated masks are the N95, which means it's not, they don't trap 95% of all aerosols. They trap 95% of the particles of the worst size to trap, which is 0.3 microns. Anything smaller than that, they trap it at a higher rate. Anything bigger than that, they trap at a higher rate. So their actual filtration efficiency is up around 99% for airborne viruses and things like that. Um, the KF94 is the Korean standard of the N95. It's 94% efficient at that worst particle. The KN95 is the Chinese standard. The FFP2 is the European standard. Um, KF94s and N95s universally are very, very good. Um, KN95s, unfortunately, there's probably for every one real one, there's a knockoff that's out there. And some of these knockoffs are at the same level as a cloth mask. So, you know, if you're looking for a high quality KN95, Amazon is not your friend there. Go to Project N95 or something like that. They vet and certify every single one that comes out. So they are certainly the best type of mask that you can have. Um, the quality of the filtration and trapping they do is dependent on the mask and the quality of fit on your face. Um, then when you start getting away from those respirator type masks, you get into surgical masks and they come as a procedure mask, a surgical type one, surgical type two, and a surgical type three. The type three is what your dentist wears when they're drilling in your mouth. They were made to block large droplets and aerosols because think about the aerosols that are coming in the mouth when you're drilling. Um, they're to protect the dentist from everything that's being aerosolized out of your mouth. So they are actually a really good and cheap mask to use as a day-to-day -day mask. And again, the fit of those becomes really important. You put it on, you've got a pretty good fit. If you put a cloth mask over the top of that, you've got an even better fit. It's not the cloth mask is providing you with better filtration. Nope. It's just holding the surgical mask onto your face in a better way. Um, and basically, the way I'd like you to think about it is if I've got a mask that is 50% efficient, so that's say a two or three ply cloth mask, and you're wearing a mask that's 50% efficient, I'm infected, what I'm breathing out, um, my mask will trap half of the risk, it'll drop the risk to 50% of what it was, and then your mask will trap 50% of the remaining risk. So the remaining risk is about 25%. That means you get about four times longer around that person before you will inhale the infectious dose. If you change it to a higher quality mask, so if I put on a mask that is 90% efficient, so let's say one of these that's not quite perfect. If I put that on, I reduce the risk 90%, leaving 10% risk remaining. And if the other person is wearing a high quality mask, they reduce that remaining 10% by 90%. So the amount of risk remaining is 1%. So you can be around that person for about 100 times longer before you get infected. And that's the way that you need to, to think about masks is the quality on them and the quality on you dictates the risk of transmission. So if you're in an environment where there's a lot of people who are unmasked, you would go with a higher quality mask because you're only getting one way filtering. If you're in an environment such as an office space where you have a masking policy, then you don't all need to be in N95s because you're overdoing the risk. You could be in a good quality surgical mask and still end up in a, a really good situation that way. So um, mask protection is additive. And so good quality masks definitely do improve the risk of infection or lower the risk of infection down. There's a very specific question about 3M N95 models or model 1860. Um, 
if those are familiar to you, but maybe you could just repeat the, the sites you would go to um, to get good maps as well. Yeah, so um, project, I'm just gonna check to make sure that I'm in 95. Yeah, so it, this is not a commercial, this is a group of doctors and people that got together to make sure that the masks are being vetted correctly that they meet um, uh, the NIOSH standard that are actually coming out, or they meet the Korean standard or the um, uh, Chinese standard. So it's literally Project N95. Um, yeah, they work with groups to sell only vetted high quality masks. So if you were looking for a high quality mask, that would be a great way to go. If you can find the 3M brand N95 models online, it's a great US brand. It'll have the right NIOSH stamp. You'll be fine with that. Um, but if you're looking for you know, buying packs of 10 and making sure that they are certified, um, that particular place, that uh, whole warehousing place um, really builds their reputation on doctors and people in compliance validating that these meet the appropriate standards to be out. So, oh, and I'm not, you may have answered this earlier, but just to, um be clear if if one was to to get uh covid either as an unvaccinated or uh let's say a vaccinated but not boosted person should they get boosted and if so how long should they wait yeah so if you're unvaccinated and you get a first infection um you will benefit greatly from getting um realistically one shot um, but two shots will give you an even better protection. That hybrid immunity is the most robust that we've got. So an unvaccinated person who gets infected, um, I strongly encourage you going out for one of the mRNA shots, um, you know, getting that series because you will develop not only the breadth that you got from infection of immunity, but a very high level of specificity of immunity to that spike protein that helps you to protect yourself against further infection and severe outcomes. So that is really important. Now, if you found yourself in the situation of, I went through and I got my two vaccines or I got my J&J &J, and then I got infected, um, the boost side of things, you know, there's a little bit of a difference on what I would recommend. If you got infected with Delta, so anything prior to December 1st was Delta. If you got infected back then with Delta, um, getting a boost would really help you with Omicron. Um, there's little doubt about that. I, I'm seeing a lot of reinfections of people that had Delta, and then two months later, three months later, are getting infected with Omicron. So a boost would actually help you with the Omicron infection. If you made it through Delta without infection and got infected in the last month and a bit, so the Omicron side of things, um, there is no real need right now to go out and get a boost. Mother Nature has given that to you to the primary variant that's out there, which is Omicron. So you've got vaccine immunity, you've got infection immunity. Um, there is no hurry to go out and get a boost right now. You really could wait you know, three months and see what happens with the science and things changed. If you wanted to get a boost, um, all you need to do is wait for roughly 10 days after symptoms have resolved. And then biologically, you can get a boost and it will bump your immunity up a little bit. Um, but I, I haven't seen anything that suggests that it's um, medically necessary at this stage. Another question on masks, just returning to that. How, how yeah. long can you keep them and use them? And uh, sort of how do you know when you, you've used up a mask? Uh, yeah. So surgical masks at 30 cents each and me being you know, fortunate, I throw them out every day. Um, I'm able to pay that and throw them out every day um, just so I'm not reusing them. Um, when I am using a higher quality mask, um, say it's an N95, um, I would A, change it when it looks dirty. Um, part of the reason why I went to darker masks, they don't get dirty as quickly. I can hide it for a bit longer. But the main time you need to change it is if it gets wet or if it starts to get more difficult to breathe through it. So beginning of the pandemic, we had you know, doctors, nurses in ICU wards wearing them for an entire week. 
So 12 hour shifts, five or four days a week. Well, they didn't like it, but they were able to work and still function you know, efficiently. So I would change a mask when it gets wet and or dirty um, or on a roughly weekly basis if you're wearing it consistently. Um, what I had, and just you know, as a thought, um, I had a very high quality you know, N95 mask that I had a Ziploc bag. I put in a little silicon packet inside there and I would wear it when I was flying on a plane or getting on public transport. When I was putting myself into the throat of the fire, it was my transportation mask. I put it on and then I put it into the Ziploc bag the little silica packet would you know, adjust the, the moisture out of it. And then you can just use that essentially for a very long period of time. I'd go into a more comfortable mask when the risk was actually lower. Um, but easily you're getting multiple days out of a mask. Um, if you're not doing a lot of physical work, like a week would not be unheard of with a, you know, with an N95 used in our situation where we're not really in a dusty, dirty, or high infection environment. That's good. Um, so one thing we haven't talked about, and I know you have, uh, you've talked about a lot with the, uh, with the judges and your own sort of thinking about boosting early on was long COVID. And I'm wondering if you could talk a little bit about what the data suggests so far about the relationship of Omicron and long COVID. Yes. So long COVID has been, long COVID for me was one of the drivers that um, tipped me over the edge for vaccinating my children. I've got a 12 and a 15 year old. Um, you know, I, you know, you sit back and you think they're young, they're healthy, the chances of poor outcomes are very, you know, really like really low. Um, but then being as close to this as what I am, I was seeing the data coming out of Florida where through there, for example, their Delta surge um, you were looking at, you know, they, they've got right at the moment about 27,000 children with long COVID. And that is COVID symptoms that are lasting for at least six months. And it might be as small as smell and taste is gone. Um, but in a significant proportion of these people, you're looking at an inability to play more than five minutes of sporting activities. Um, you're looking at heart inflammation. You're looking at organ damage. Um, these things are really, they, that was to me, like if there was a way I could minimize my chances of getting this, um, I was going to take that. And because it wasn't the disease and death, it was the long-term symptoms that came afterwards. So current estimates, you know, with the previous things was about 3% of all people will be, will have symptoms that last for at least six months after infection. Um, and that's sort of the last bit that holds back in my mind about you know, why don't I just throw my arms up in the air and say, oh, let's learn to live with it and just get it over with, is that long COVID risk that happens with kids, that happens with adults. I don't want that. I, I want to be living a full, healthy life. And if I can delay this to get better treatments and drugs or understand more about it, I will. Um, so when now along comes Omicron, and obviously we can't talk about long COVID with Omicron because we haven't had Omicron for a long period of time. Um, Omicron, you know, the first wave of people are really at just two months right now. But the first signal about long-term uh, symptoms is only, it's actually less than 1%. So there seems to be less long COVID with Omicron than what we've seen with previous variants. Um, there will be more long COVID in the community because more people will be infected. But from an individual level, it looks like the risk has dropped you know, somewhere in the vicinity of 60 to 80% of developing long COVID symptoms. Um, so I can't say it scares the daylights out of me. It's just that black box that's out there at the moment that I don't know what the impact of this is going to be. Like everyone might resolve with long COVID in 12 months. Um, you know, I've had people that absolutely love their red wine and they're frustrated to death that they're 12 months out and they cannot taste a bottle of red. They've lost their one thing in life that they really loved away from work and family. Um, and then, you know, some of the people that we came across with, you know, Judge McConnell, when we were in, you know, going to the prison system, he's like, I love playing basketball and I haven't been able to play basketball for six months. And it's that type of thing that just makes me pause a little bit about, you know, that side. But long COVID is just this mystery. We don't know a lot about it. But thankfully, the Omicron long COVID looks like it's much less than Delta. 
Uh, there's one other question coming back to testing about uh, rates of error and you know their accuracy rates, both PCRs and antigens. Um, yeah. Maybe you can speak to that just a minute. Yeah, so in a perfectly run lab with low community prevalence, um, you're looking at a lab error, a false positive rate for PCR of around about one in 3,000 to one in 5,000 um, tests. It is incredibly low. And you just need to look at Australia for that with, they were running 100,000 tests a day and only getting two people in the country testing positive up until things went crazy. We know when you're running them well. When you get to the situation that we are right now, where you've got labs absolutely slammed, there is a huge number. So on a plate that they're running for a PCR, you've got 383 other samples on there with yours. And if the tiniest little drop comes over and spills into your well, it could give you a result that says that you're positive and you're really not. And unfortunately that is happening. The more infection in the community, the more frequent false positives come up with those PCR tests. And it's pretty hard to work out how many they are, but if you test positive on antigen and you test positive on a PCR, you're infected. If you've got symptoms and a PCR or an antigen test comes up positive, you're infected. So we always, I always use two things to determine what's going on. Now, from an antigen test point of view, um, the Binax now tests, um, it gets round about one in every 3,000 tests will be a false positive result. So it will tell you that you're infected when you're really not. So in practical terms, if it comes up positive, you are infected. The other side of things is what about false negatives? Well, great, great study came out yesterday, um, showed that an antigen test doesn't amplify the amount of virus that's there. It looks for exactly what you've got. And if you don't have enough virus to come up positive on an antigen test, you don't have enough virus to infect somebody. And so when they looked at the relationship between PCR and antigen tests, when you're at that level of virus where it's really low and you've got to amplify the sample 30, 35, 40 times, to get a positive on PCR, your antigen test won't work. It will give you a negative, but your PCR will come up positive. But the thing is you're not infectious right then. When you get below 30 cycles, if it only takes 20 cycles to get a positive on PCR, your antigen test is in agreement with the PCR 98% of the time. And just to put it out there, this is why they always sell tests in two packs because you could be testing on one day and we've taken 35 PCR cycles to get a positive. The next day, because of how the virus builds up, you'll be at 25. So that's why Binax comes in two tests. You test one day and it's negative. If you test 24 hours later and it's going to be positive because you've built up that viral load. That's why the sequential testing is there. Um, so the tests are really good at testing like the antigen tests for infectiousness. Can I infect somebody right now? Okay, that's really, uh, really great. Now I know we only have you for- uh, I got a little uh, bit of time. For an hour and uh, uh, and so I, I think I'll, I'll end with, um, well, there's a couple of questions. Maybe I'll ask one or two more and then uh, I have a final yeah, I, I, I'd like to hit that last one that came up. So the okay. um, Delta Cron doesn't exist. Um, it was a sequencing error from the lab that um, a person highly likely co-infected. So when they isolated the virus from that person and put it into a sequencing run, you ended up with both the genome of Delta and the genome of Omicron in the one sample, giving rise to this, um, to this Delta Cron. So it's one lab with one lot of runs, all the same, and it's not being repeated anywhere else. So at this stage, it's just a, a nothing burger. Um, so it's not something to get worried about right now at all. And I see a question about uh, some elite athletes who've had some uh, heart attacks uh, while playing soccer. I know you're a soccer uh, fan yeah. and coach. Uh, any comments on that? No, so I mean, this is, this is literally always happened. Um, 
that you're getting these elite athletes, and this can be high school, this can be, you know, in professional sports, that the amount of exertion that they put out and the lack of rest and training leads to these, you know, cardiac side of these cardiac problems. And we saw like the rollout in New York of all schools have to be trained to identify cardiac problems in elite athletes and be able to respond to it because it's been a problem. So could the vaccine or infection be involved in what seems to be an increased uptick of this recently? And the answer to that is absolutely yes. Um, we know that with the mRNA vaccines and the spike proteins that it makes, it manufactures in your body, that we have seen the pericarditis and myocarditis in primarily young men, you know, under the age of 30 or so, where they'll end up with heart inflammation. Um, very transient, um, able to recover well. And it's somewhere in the vicinity of one in every 7,000 men under that age will develop transient myocarditis. Um, put a heart under a lot of stress and struggle, then that could go to something that you actually see. But I wanna flip that around and say, then what is the risk of that same symptom happening with infection? And it's believed to be around one in 150 to one in 250. So there is certainly something going on with this virus and in inflammation of organs that is having a rare, but we're seeing it enough of a signal effect on you know, young men under the age of 30, under the age of 40, that certainly needs to, to be looked at. But the balance you've got to look at is if one thing is happening one in every six and a half thousand times, and the other thing is happening one in every 250 times, you try to avoid the one that happens one in every 250 times, which is infection. And you know that can be taken care of with vaccination. So we cannot discount the risk or the association of vaccine with this, um, but every vaccine, every medication comes down to a risk analysis of what is the risk of an adverse outcome from infection? What is the risk of an adverse outcome from the treatment from the vaccine or the drug? And making sure that there is um, an appropriate fold difference um, in what we're doing there. Otherwise, the treatment would never get approved. Um, that is part of the reason why it is taking so long to get the vaccine approved for the under the age of five. You have to, because they have very low bad outcomes to infection um, compared to a 75-year-old, that the safety of the vaccine has to be infinitely higher than what it was for that 75-year-old group. So it's all risk analysis and judging which way it goes. And thank, and I'm glad that they're taking their time to really make sure that this is correct. Well, maybe just to end, uh, since you mentioned Australia and you are Australian, uh, uh, I think we'd like to hear your comments on Novak Djokovic and whether he should be allowed to play in the Australian Open. And if he is allowed to play, do you think he's going to win? Uh, well, the last bit, that's the interesting one. Um, I, I think for moral character, he should be removed from the country. Um, and the reason I say this, even if he followed the right rules of, you know, he got the right visa at the right time, he tested positive on the 16th and went and did public events on the 17th, the 18th, and was around many other people. Um, I, I just, I don't, I don't understand that mentality right now to do that for a, a photo opportunity. Um, so he either did this at a blazon disregard for other people's health and safety, or he made it up that he actually tested positive on those dates. So I look at, I think he did everything right by the filing side of things to get into the country but he has to answer for the other parts of what he did, which I think it doesn't really give me that moral upstanding citizen. Um, and we do, and I mean, in Australia, we hold our athletes to a very, very high standard um, that we expect them to behave better than the general community in their public activities. So, um, I, you know, if he's allowed to play I hope someone else beats him. <laughs> <laughs> well, that is a that is a perfect 
uh, way to end this session, I think. Um, I, I really, I can't thank you enough, Aaron, for, uh, for being so uh, willing to, to make yourself available to uh, our court family and to the, uh, to the bar. Um, and you've, you've really gone above and beyond. I know you've, you've done it in other, in other districts. Um, you've really, it's not an exaggeration to say that we've navigated the pandemic as uh, well as we have uh, because of you. And so um, really want to thank you and uh, do it publicly. Um, and I know a lot of other judges all around the country feel the same way. So we really owe you a big debt of gratitude. I really appreciate hearing that, Judge Smith. So yeah. thank you. All right. Well, thanks, everybody. And everybody stay safe. Have a wonderful week, everybody. Enjoy the coldness. Bye. <laughs> Bye. Bye. Thank you. Thank you.